for week two. Thank you for coming. Um, we have ground rules which you heard last time, and I'm going to repeat them so everybody can hear them. Um, be recognized before speaking. And during this session, please wait till the speakers have completely finished before asking questions. Um, make concise statements, engage in active listening, and be respectful. And I know you all were fabulous last week, and, and we thank you for that. So um, this week we're having uh, city government and city engagement, how city government works, guiding principles and vision, and the three branches of government. And we are going to go around again like we did last week, but we're going to do it a little bit differently this time. Um, so we're going to state your name, what your neighborhood council is, and say something nice about your neighborhood that you like. So, I'm Jane Kelly, I'm the Neighborhood Coordinator, and I've worked for the City of Missoula for 15 years. I'm John Egan, I'm the Mayor of Missoula. I worked for the City for some period of time now, uh, it's hard to remember. Uh, I, uh, I, live in the, I live about four blocks from the house I grew up on, on South 2nd Street, and it's a lovely neighborhood, close to the good food store. And um, while I avoid kale, I like the rest of the stuff they had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brian Von Osberg. I've been on city council for five years now. Um, I live in the north side, right across from Whittier School, the Head Start School. Uh, and what I, one of the many things I love about that neighborhood is the fact that we have the uh, community cinema up on the side of the school um, in, the, in the park there uh, every Saturday night during the summer. Um, I'm Sarah Gray. I direct the Masters of Public Administration from the University of Montana. I live on the west side, north side. Um, so I like it because I get to walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we get to walk to Burn Street and Easter. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm Kathleen Jenks. I am the Municipal Court Judge. And um, I want to talk about downtown Missoula instead of where I live because that's where I spend most of my time at work. And I love downtown Missoula because it's so accessible and it's just a lovely downtown. Dale? Well, I'm Dale Bickle. I'm the city's chief administrative officer. Um, I've been with the city for about uh, five years. Part of that, I was the chief administrative officer and chief financial officer uh, for Missoula County for 14 years. Um, I live over by the Dairy Queen off Higgins, and I love walking there with my kids on the summer night. Thank you. Okay. Let's start over here. I'm Sierra Farmer. I live on the north side, west side, and I said this last week, but it's uh, the good hood. Um, and I also am living a few blocks away from where I grew up, and I could go on and on about why it's the best neighborhood in Missoula. We have a great brewery, we have a great school, um, but I don't know where you guys. <laughs> I'm Jeff Berkby, and I live on East Sussex Avenue in the University District um, for about 12 years. And I moved there specifically when I moved here because I like the, the mix of the 5,000 students on campus and the vibrancy and the, the homes in the university area. They're stuffed full of renters. The change in the spring and change in the fall, you get to see where they flow with different dynamics in the area. So it's a really interesting to see that. Too. Bryce, we're not going to skip you. I'm Howdy, my name is Bryce. I live in the University District, um, the Fifth Street. I've been uh, in Missoula for six years now. I graduated from the University. I uh, love my time here and I uh, love Missoula. Randy? Hi, my name is Brandy Sulars and I um, live right across from Greeno Park. Um, one of my favorite parts is introducing people to the bear cage in Greeno Park. <laughs> um, it's a house that my grandma grew up in. And, um, I've been there for a long time, so it's a very historical spot, and I love showing the house. Thank you. Uh, I'm Danny. I am also in the Lower Rattlesnake, and uh, yeah, I just also love Reno Park and everything I saw. Great. I'm Erin Nuzo, born and raised in Missoula. I was raised in the South Hills in the Wapakia area. Um, as an adult, though, I've lived in more rural areas, Tura being one of those areas. Um, now I live in Grant Creek, and why I love Grant Creek? This is the perfect combination of rural and urban. 
She totally took what I was going to say. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, I'm Jared Keen, um, also born and raised in Missoula, also grew up on the size, south side of town in the South Hills, um, live in the Grant Creek neighborhood, and that's my favorite part of Grant Creek because it's close to nature and easily accessible to downtown and snowball and <laughs> everything that Missoula has going for it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christine Littig. I live in the Riverfront neighborhood. I also grew up in Missoula, and I'm a fourth generation Missoulian Montanan. Um, I have lived in a lot of the neighborhoods in Missoula, almost all of them. Uh, but I do currently love the neighborhood I'm living in the most, and I believe that's because I can walk almost anywhere in five minutes and or hop in my car and be in Grant Creek in five minutes. <laughs> I'm Andy Armstrong, um, rubbing elbows with a fellow riverfront area person. So. Um, I have to credit this to Christine, but uh, I, I liked how she called it uh, perfectly located. I definitely agree. If I have tickets to a show at the Wilma, I can just walk down and walk home. Um, and also, um, I was chatting earlier about how my home is a time capsule. I recently found newspapers from 1923 with ads for the Wilma and all kinds of crazy articles in it stuffed in the walls of our house so it's pretty cool thank you i'm cindy sandow and i too have lived in missoula most of my life and have lived all over town in different neighborhoods currently in miller creek and i think my favorite part really up there right now is that most of us have been there since before we had kids and we've met each other through our kids and there's a really great group of people that are real close. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alex Fregario, lived in Missoula 14 years, um, and I'm in Miller Creek as well. And uh, one of my favorite parts about Miller Creek is the Miller Creek Cafe at the uh, Linda Vista Golf Course there. They have great burgers. Uh, Dwight Easton, I've uh, lived in Missoula 26 years. Uh, Linda Vista Boulevard didn't go much beyond my house when I first moved up there, so. I've seen it grow. It's been a great place to raise kids. Nice. Uh, Elena Hardy, Lewis and Clark. I have been in Missoula for 13 months. Um, my favorite thing about Lewis and Clark, drum coffee, fence, dog park, soccer fields, water park. Nice. I'm Jess Allred, and I'm also in Lewis and Clark. Um, and my kid will get to walk to school his entire school career. We're really close to Lewis and Clark and Washington and, and Sentinel as well. Great. I'm Colleen Baldwin. I live at Canyon Creek. I were in uh, the Grant Creek. Um, we are the newest neighborhood in Missoula. And um, the thing I enjoy most, is, for one thing, it is one of the few areas that was uh, hopefully deliberately, deliberately built to have aging in place. Uh, you have your facilities, your bedroom, kitchen, all on one floor, as well as whatever else you may have. That's the central plan out there. So there are many of us choosing to live as we age out there, plus a lot of families. It's very nice that we, we really enjoy the neighborhood. Thank you. My name is Meg Witcher. I've now lived in Missoula longer than I've lived anywhere in my life, five years. So it's about as home as it gets for me. Um, I live north side, just a couple blocks down from Bullies on 3rd, um, and I love the north side because I feel like it's easily defendable in case there was a war because we have, <laughs> there's one way in the north side and there's one way out and it's not a free bridge and the interstate and the railroad tracks blocks everything, so like, <laughs> north side is, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Kylie Dillerman, I hope Meg lets me over the bridge at the end time. side, west side, um, and I think my favorite thing about it is that we are a under 10 minute hike bike to open space, to restaurants, to breweries. Last night walking my dog, every single person I met said hi, wanted to pet him, so it's just a really great place. Fabulous. Topper? Um, Topper Hair and uh, Franklin to the Fort, and we were talking about some of the uh, redevelopment with parks and schools in our neighborhood. Thank you. I'm Sarah Ferguson, and I am also in the Franklin to Fort uh, area. And um, I guess what I really love is um, Franklin Park and being also near the school and just, uh, you know, witnessing kind of the 
the change and the kind of heartbeat you can feel in the neighborhood. Hi, I'm Megan Robson, also from Franklin to the Fort. You're going to hear a lot about Franklin to the Fort, I guess, for the people to run here. Um, and I'm from Billings originally, so I'm just going to put this out to everybody. Your neighborhoods are all better than Billings. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's not a bad in Missoula, right? Um, but I love our neighborhood because I have some of the nicest neighbors on the planet. Thank you. Larry? I'm Larry Crom. I live on 34th Street in Triangle neighborhood. It's a neighborhood of a lot of retirees and modest rancher type homes, but also a lot of uh, low income housing and a lot of variety and such. Um, I live in my parents' house that I inherited. They bought it in 1964 new. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Kushel. I'm representing Barbies, Patty Canyon. I live in the house that my family bought in the early 60s. It was built in 58. My neighborhood, at least my street, is uh, there's not much turnover. The, a lot of the neighbors that I know of have been there since, you know, 35 years, and they're not going anywhere soon. We're slowly starting to see some turnover as people age out. And I guess my favorite part is, yes, it's close to downtown, but if I don't want to go to town, it's very nostalgic. I can stay home and be Betty Crocker, or go to walk, or just enjoy the view. Thank you. I'm Carol Meeper. I live out in the uh, Captain John Mullen um, neighborhood. And what I like about it, um, I'm further out. Um, and I like the uh, ruralness and the, um, the open space out there. Um, I have great neighbors. Um, I really. Um, appreciate the diversity in, in my neighborhood council. Um, we have a lot of um, low income and um, wealthy um, with a, a big spread in between. And I think that adds to the complexity of the neighborhood, but also the um, diversity and people helping one another. Uh, Shane Stack, Franklin to the Fort. Uh, a few things that I like about the neighborhood, Benson's Farm, even though it's in the county, I still can go across the street and grab some fresh vegetables. I think it's an awesome amenity. Um, we are really centrally located in the community, so I can pretty much go from my front door, I can get on my bike, or I can go for a run, I can get into the mountains uh, really quick, or I can get down to the Bitterroot, um, down to Hamilton if I want. Um, and those trails and those types of things are right outside my front door. Thank you. Nick? Uh, Nishans River Road, um, things I like about my neighborhood are it's basically all cul-de-sacs, so there's not a lot of traffic, so <laughs> the kids can play on the street and not have to worry about anybody racing through, which is nice. Um, we also have River Road Farm, which is uh, uh, from Garden City, or, uh, Garden City Organics, so that's a cool addition. Um, I think it's up and coming, lots of things are changing in our neighborhood right now, which is cool. William Fury, I'm West Side part of North Side, West Side. And I love that our neighborhood is funky. I think that's as a result of no HOAs, which I love. And um, because of reasons Meg's brought up, uh, no deer either. I'm <laughs> 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 Caitlin. Um, I live downtown. And I like that our neighborhood leadership council is all women. <laughs> the only one. The only one. <laughs> I'm Nancy De Castillo, Upper Rattlesnake. Um, I love the incredible access to the trails and open space, and that we're five minutes from downtown unless you run into the train. Ricky. <laughs> I'm Ricky Blue. I live in Rose Park. Um, I really like it. It's a quiet, family-oriented neighborhood, but it's also five minutes from downtown, and I'm a block away from Victor. I'm Casey Erickson. I'm also in Rose Park. Also lucky, like so many of us, that we can walk to downtown, the university, anywhere. Thank you. Brett? I'm Brett Rosenberg. I live in Upper Rattlesnake. And one of my favorite things about Upper Rattlesnake is the great diversity in interpretations of leash laws. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm Tim DeFores. I live in the Marshall Canyon neighborhood, which is the one past East Missoula, if you've never been out there. But uh, it's it's a newish neighborhood, and, and what I like about it is everyone, everyone's new to the neighborhood. 
<laughs> so anyway, and houses are still being built out there. Well, I think everybody likes Missoula, so let's hear it from Missoula. <laughs> Thank you, Karen has a couple of announcements to make and then we'll continue on. So I have a couple updates for you with your binders. I've put two pages, just blank pages, that you can use for notes in the very back of your binders. And also, please note on the schedules, um, next session will be at the fire department station four, and that's at 311 Ladmore Street. And those are new schedules that have been put in there. So if you're looking at your old ones, that look for the 3011 Ladmore Street on your schedule. That's where we will be meeting next week. Where is Ladmore? Where is Ladmore? Out past West Broadway. It's, it's kind of like the old quality supply, Murdoch. It's right on the street yep. next to Murdoch. And the, one more thing, um, we've been talking about the MCAT, that they'll be um, providing these sessions. Um, and you will be able to start watching those February 4th, um, will be last week's session uh, on February 4th at 5 p.m. and then Thursday, February 7th at 10 o'clock a.m. And they'll also be on there on demand, and that's channel 190. And then the next week, that following Monday, February 11th, will be tonight's, and that'll be at 5 o'clock p.m. and Thursday, February 14th will be at 10 o'clock a.m. and we'll just can, kind of continue on that schedule. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. And oh, and, and there also have been inquiries about the um, PowerPoints, and we will be sending you those through the emails as well. Thanks. All right, one other very important thing before we go turn it over. Last week I said that we were going to go next door and have a drink after this. I just want to let everybody know we are on for that following. <laughs> I don't have the hidden agenda, so. Oh, well, Jean, are you Shall I? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Mr. Mayor, it's yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's really unusual to be in this room and um, hear what a wonderful place Missoula is. <laughs> Typically on Monday evenings, we get a little bit of a contrast around that. Um, so it's uh, pretty wonderful to hear how much you all enjoy it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope what you take um, from, uh, from these sessions um, is that uh, a lot of what you enjoy isn't an accident. It's actually more or less deliberate. Um, and it is a product of you, right? Local government is a product of the people. And my uh, firm belief is that uh, there is, there is no, there is no level of government that is more important, more accessible, and provides more opportunity for citizens and public servants to interact. So, um, some of that happens in this room, but for me, it happens everywhere. Um, whether I'm at the grocery store, in the waiting room, at the doctor's office, um, at city hall, in a park. Uh, where, wherever I go, um, I am accountable to the people I serve, I live with the people I serve, and I, uh, I enjoy the benefits of decisions that are made in and around this building, and I also suffer the consequences, as it were. Um, and the beauty is that uh, when you all get tired of me or any of my colleagues, you get to send me packing, and you get to replace me with somebody whose values more aligned with yours, and that's the beauty of the place and the beauty of the system. I have to represent the executive branch of local government, which um, is uh, the place I love to be. I served as a city council member for four years. Um, it was delightful service. Uh, those folks worked too hard, so I tried to find another job in city government where I didn't have to do nearly as much, um, but got more credit. And <laughs> If you run for mayor and get elected, this is what you get. Um, so 
I am required by our charter to do two things. One is deliver a budget to the Missoula City Council, and the other is uh, to preside over council meetings. And the rest of my time is free. <laughs> but my predecessors and anyone who takes this job, anyone who begs for this job, anyone who respects the job recognizes that there is much more to this job than those two things. I'm responsible on a daily basis for all of the souls who work for the city of Missoula. And they range from people who carry guns to people who teach little kids how to swim to people who pound on chess to make sure that someone's life goes on another day to folks who make sure that sewer pipes run clear and now that water pipes run freely. Um, and it is a tremendous responsibility, it is a tremendous privilege, and it's a tremendous joy. It also comes with moments of heartbreak. Um, but all in, I get to make choices with all of you about the way this community operates, looks, feels over time, and it is a pure joy. On a daily basis, what I'm responsible for is making sure that the wheels generally stay on the wagon. Um, and while I'm responsible for that and accountable for it, I don't do it all. So our branch of government is really about the nuts and bolts of running a city. And I have a team of folks at the management level and a team of folks um, who are on the front lines of delivering those services every day. Um, and again, I'm responsible for and accountable to them. Um, and we have a great team here at the City of Missoula, and over time I hope you get to meet more of those folks who are doing that work. Uh, I get to do the administrative stuff, right? I execute the policies that the City Council approves. Um, I listen to you and help develop those policies. Um, and in some cases, I either uh, lead by leading or I lead by following. And so in some cases, folks can come to this room, express their opinions, and drive us to action. That is the beauty of local government. I'll give you a quick example. Our friends on the west side, north side, you really need to make a choice at some point, <laughs> but we'll go with west side, north side for our purposes. Meg, I'm sorry about the potential for the zombie apocalypse. I'm glad you're prepared, however. Um, we, had a, we had a group of neighbors from uh, the west side uh, come see us in mass on a Monday evening and said, we are uncomfortable in our neighbors. We're worried about crime. We're worried about um, safety. We're worried about lighting. We're worried about our children. Um, and from, from that expression of those concerns, um, one Monday evening here, the city of Missoula collectively sprang into action. And whether it's the elected representatives who serve the ward, um, me or my staff, we're all meeting now regularly with neighbors to address those issues. And that's a function of folks having the faith and trust in government to be sincere in our response. It ain't perfect, it's slow. Um, in some cases, it's expensive. In some cases, the product is, um, doesn't meet expectations, but the fact of the matter is that, um, that citizens can make a difference in the way this government operates and the way our city provides services. And I see those examples again and again. Um, we do, uh, in addition to my responsibilities here uh, on Monday evenings, um, I'm responsible for uh, for what the legislative branch of government does. So uh, while I preside over council meetings, the, the power um, of policy and the power of the checkbook lives with the Missoula City Council, those 12 folks, um, uh, and I generally, with uh, a few notable exceptions, um, and those exceptions um, ebb and flow uh, with elections, um, we, we're generally sitting around this table trying to solve problems and do our best to serve the people we swore we would take care of. Um, the executive branch also does the financial stuff. We do the legal stuff. Um, and we interact as comfortably as we can with the judicial branch. Um, Judge James is here this evening. Um, and, and while it turns out I signed her paycheck, he acknowledges that in absolutely no way. <laughs> uh, 
so we do have these distinct branches of government, much like the federal government. Uh, but at this level, I think we work together a little better than um, some of the examples that we're seeing, uh, certainly on the federal level and in some cases on the state level. I am very interested in answering your questions. When the time comes, I will stop so that others can talk. Uh, that's the executive branch, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hello. First rule, never follow the mayor uh, in a speaking <laughs> activity. Um, so you literally had one slide that just said executive branch. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is true power. Um, uh, so I'm Ryan von Lossberg, uh, city council member. Um, there's only two of us on city council, actually, who are in a second term, which is a little bit uh, unusual for, for recent terms. Jordan Hess, for those of you who are in Ward 2, is one of those folks. Um, and then myself, and I represent Ward 1. Rattlesnake, great to see uh, folks from Rattlesnake here. Uh, north side, I was going to make a crack about the north side, west side thing. Uh, I, I get that they're in the same neighborhood council thing, but as a north sider um, across the tracks, it's nice to hear the north and west side folks refer to it as north side, west side. I, I really love that. Um, I get to go home tonight. Uh, to my six-year-old first grader uh, at Lowell and simply say that I was in a room with Meg Wisher and she will find that extremely excited. She does a lot of parks programs uh, with <laughs> Meg. And Meg is like one of the most amazing resources uh, for the city. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for being here. Um, and I would mention some folks I didn't mention. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to be behind this. Um, that felt very close. Um, <laughs> River Oak Farm, my wife uh, is Genevieve Marsh. Uh, if any of you uh, work with Garden City Harvest at all or have a CSA, you might uh, encounter her. She's the more lovely and uh, good person in, in our couple. Um, I will use these as some prompts. I'm guessing, Jane, that the first thing that happened was that you, you introduced these folks to the charter. So I will spend little time uh, going over it other than to say, you know, the mayor referenced it. It's, it, it's critical, hugely important. Um, a couple of things that I would note from it are, you know, this is where we get uh, the empowerment for the council. Uh, a lot of this is, I'll, I'll kind of try to go through the dry stuff pretty quickly, and then there were some great prompts from Jane um, and I think Gwen and Heather uh, that I'll go to, to to make it less dry. But this is where, you know, we've got six wards in the city. I'm guessing everyone here knows which ward there. Does anyone not know what ward there is? Okay, that's actually pretty rare when I encounter people in Missoula. Um, yeah, 12 members, uh, uh, two in each uh, ward on staggered four-year terms. Um, I get the pleasure of serving with uh, Heidi West, is my colleague for Ward 1. And this is, uh, these are the folks. And as the mayor mentioned, we're the legislative branch. We're the policy making branch. And um, I think it's worth reflecting on, you know, policy comes from a variety of places. Sometimes it comes from uh, the executive branch. Uh, sometimes it comes from a council member or a group of council members with an idea or a passion. And uh, oftentimes it comes from constituents. And I've had a couple cases serving on council and they've been among the most rewarding, difficult, challenging, hard uh, uh, processes and opportunities being on council to actually carry legislation all the way through from an idea to, to ordinance and, and two of those came from um, constituents uh, in, uh, in the Rattlesnake actually. So and I'm really, that, that's been one of the most rewarding aspects of council is listening to people who have an idea, uh, make a case for why it should be implemented and then you work alongside those folks uh, to make that happen. Um, let's see. <coughs> don't expect you to be able to read all this, and I think you don't have these now, but you're going to get these slides uh, as a, in a package. But um, worth knowing uh, that the, the down in the weeds business that we do mostly happens on Wednesdays. Um, Monday nights are obviously the official council meetings, but our committee meeting days are Wednesdays, uh, subject to our rules. And these are the committees uh, that make up um, the various areas where we do our work. 
There's administration and finance. Heather uh, chairs that committee. Committee of the whole and budget committee of the whole. Uh, I chair as um, I, I serve as city council president right now. Really honored to work with Gwen as vice president. Um, so I chair those committee of the whole meetings. So when you hear people talk about cow and be cow, we're talking about those, not actual cows. Um, parks and conservation, Gwen chairs. Uh, I used to chair parks when I first got on council and uh, a point of, of levity perhaps. Uh, when I first got on council, I remember being absolutely terrified of, uh, you know, coming in here on a Wednesday and those, there's, because there's this process and it's a very deliberate process with, um, you know, public comment on motions and at different times. And uh, when I, I first got on, uh, another colleague was chairing parks and I offered to serve as the vice chair. Uh, Caitlin uh, Koppel was the one, and Caitlin left, and so I took over chairing the Parks Committee. And I can tell you, actually before she left, but the first time I was going to chair a meeting, I watched like several videotapes of committee meetings to make sure I was going to get the process down. And it's kind of funny to think about now because it's really not that big a deal, and there's a whole bunch of people who are going to help you work it out. But for anyone who feels slightly nervous or intimidated about ever coming and making public comment on you know, a Monday night or at a committee meeting, Please know that people are terrified sitting behind uh, <laughs> the seats uh, as well. Um, I, in a former life, used to build uh, spaceships uh, for the Jet Propulsion Lab, a part of NASA. I worked with a great team to put, if you saw the movie The Martian, I, my team built part of what landed on Mars, and I think I'm more terrified in the beginning of you know, making sure I ran a public meeting properly than you know, failing at getting this thing on the surface of Mars. Um, land use and planning is, uh, I think, really one of the hardest committees to chair, and it's among the most important work we do. This is land use decisions that you know, affect, uh, I mean, they, they make up the city, whether it's subdivisions or town home exemption development projects or any number of you know, zoning related sort of things. That work is in LUP, I think the mayor used to chair a former, they called it P, what? P-A-Z? P-A-Z. Um, John Navari from Ward 4 uh, chairs that committee. John had a lot of experience on planning board and it's made him really well suited to, to chairing that committee. Public works, uh, we have a water utility to run now that we've been doing for a while along with sewer and other infrastructure. That action happens in public works. Jordan Hess from Ward 2 chairs that and then public safety and health uh, and Michelle Paris checks those committees. So that's where, you know, when we're proposing, when an ordinance or policy comes forward, first we take it up in committee and then eventually it might make it out of committee and up to a public hearing uh, at, a, at a council uh, meeting on a Monday night. It, it often gets sent back to committee for more work. So it's, it's a long process. Um, it's a deliberative process. It can be frustrating with how sort of long and deliberative uh, it is, and, and deliberate, um, but there's a reason for that. When we make policy decisions, they should be well considered and, and thought out. And uh, one of the things I, I enjoy about council and this community is that the, this community and, and the council and the administration are willing to have difficult conversations. This is a community that embraces tough, um, controversial issues. Bef right before I got in council, the city passed its non-discrimination ordinance marathon, you know, public hearings, but I'm, I'm proud of Missoula for taking up issues like that, wrestling with them, getting the public involved, and then moving forward. Um, apparently I can't work the buttons. I will not read this other than to mention it is worth noting that by virtue of our charter, we are a city with self-government powers and it gets easy to get down in the weeds and get wonk it gets wonky. But there are only some cities in the state that have charters that, um, that are then granted self-government powers. And that's, it's a big deal. And once you get the slide uh, in your package, I'd encourage you to read through it. I took a bunch of the bullet points from um, a, a notable case that delineated the difference um, between cities with and without self-government powers and then sort of the history um, back owing to our constitution, our state constitution most recently of how things were before and, and how they are now. But it's, it's an important thing um, to be aware of. I think that's it on slides. I, I just wanted to touch on 
couple of the prompts um, that I think Jane had left us with. Uh, and I guess somewhat similar to the experience um, being terrified about how to run a public meeting, one of the first things I got to do on council representing the north side was um, write a resolution for about the White Pine Sash site. So if you might be familiar with the White Pine, White Pine Sash Superfund, State Superfund site um, over in the north side. And long story short, uh, DEQ had developed a plan for this polluted area. But the plan, when it first came out, um, really was pretty insulting to the neighborhood, to put it a, a, a bluntly, and didn't envision any kind of residential potential in that area. And it was pretty distressing to sort of read DEQs and some, some lawyers' uh, characterization of, of, north, of the north side. And they kind of depicted it as this sort of commercial wasteland. And a lot of the, my neighbors and, and myself uh, felt that was an inaccurate portrayal of the potential in that area. And so I uh, conferred with one of my colleagues, Jason Weiner, who at the time was my Ward 1 colleague. And I had this idea, I think it actually came from a constituent, to write a resolution expressing you know, the reasons why we should ask DEQ to revisit that plan and actually clean up that site to residential standards instead of cleaning it up to, to only commercial standards. And when I talked to Jason, you know, I kind of said, well, is there, so where do we go? Like, how, do, how does resolution get written? Is there some sort of special resolution writer, you know, mysteriously on the staff somewhere? And he's like, you know, get your computer out and start. He's like, there's a bunch of whereases, and then there's a bunch of therefores uh, at the end, and you get to fill in the blanks. And uh, I did, and um, I'm still really proud of that resolution. Uh, we did get DDQ, not just because of that resolution, but that resolution passed unanimously on council and then led to a number of other agencies, City County Health, weighing in, and ultimately, at the, in the end, DEQ actually came back and changed their plan. They didn't change it for all 18 acres there, but they did change it for nine of the acres to, uh, to clean up that portion of residential. And if you've been over in that area, just north of that area, the old Claussen site, there's the big um, housing project over there. So it's a validation of the residential potential in that neighborhood and very empowering for, uh, for myself, but more importantly for the constituents that lived over there about seeing that change. And getting DEQ to change a plan felt at the beginning like a you know, Herculean uh, sort of task. Um, hardest part was a, a prompt, uh, and I'm gonna throw out a couple, of, well, one thing here. I expect it to be controversial. I welcome uh, following up with anybody uh, for coffee or any time afterwards. One of the hardest things for me and for some of my colleagues I know on council is social media. Um, and I'm hearing more and more people talk about this. I have these interesting debates with my wife at Garden City Harvest because she's in charge of their social media work and I can see the power and the goodness, if you will, of how it can be used. I've also seen it in local government uh, and at the same time that we're seeing some of our traditional media print is what I'm thinking of specifically experience you know, total upending of their business uh, model and cuts in their resources and staff. Uh, and I see and have come to see a much uglier side where uh, lies and untruths get spread in a viral sort of way and it, it has really made me question uh, the value of it to be quite, quite blunt. It's not that I don't recognize that it could be used for good, but on balance I'm seeing it uh, used overwhelmingly uh, to spread disinformation. So that's, that's one of the hardest things. Um, greatest unmet need, and I'll wrap this up pretty quickly here. Uh, I'll throw out a, a wonky thing that you've heard some of. I expect it to be controversial, and again, I hope that it's, and maybe it's even a topic potentially later. Um, but you've heard probably the mayor at some point and council members like myself talk about uh, a local option tax, and more specifically, the opportunity for us to come to the community with a proposal for a local option tax or tourist tax. These are, uh, Whitefish has one of these. We are prevented by statute from bringing this opportunity to the community and working together to formulate something that, that might work for the community. And if we brought you something that didn't work, it, it has to get voted to go in. So if we bring you something bad, I'm pretty confident the community will not vote it in. But we're reaching places with revenue and we live in a state without a general sales tax we also are in a state where, you know, Montana's been, been discovered for quite some time now. There's not an area in the state that's not seeing a lot of tourism. 
Tourists are great. They also use our sidewalks, our streets, our parks, our roads. And I think pretty simply, it's not unreasonable to want to derive some revenue from those folks for that infrastructure. And if you look at what happens up at Whitefish, 25% of what they raise goes right back on your property tax bill as a rebate. You actually see it on your property tax bill as here's what you would have paid, here's your 25% rebate from the, the tax. And I, I hope it's something that you dive into, even if, uh, even if I made you really mad by bringing that up. <laughs> um, last two things, <laughs> what, makes, what makes your branch or you happy? Uh, it makes me immeasurably happy when I hear other people, whether they are um, friends, neighbors, uh, talk about what they love about Missoula. And whether it's the farmer's market, whether it's breweries, whether we sent our kid to community school, I think community school is one of the greatest institutions on the planet. Um, whatever it is that makes people love Missoula, people feel pretty passionate about this community. I love, I love it. I love hearing how people came uh, to Missoula, and I love hearing what it is they, they love about it. Um, we do a lot of little things on council and those committees and contracts that we approve just to keep <coughs> government running and functioning. The mayor you know, alluded to this and talked to this a bunch. And then we do some big things. And whether it is something like the non-discrimination ordinance or some of the other bigger things like um, the water uh, acquisition, um, both of those uh, have made me really happy, um, the, the little things and, and the big things. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is I think it's interesting that in the charter's preamble, it, it gives us you know, this great description of Missoula being blessed with natural beauty and the mountains and the valleys. Um, but toward the end, it talks about uh, being thankful for a good place to live and for the rights and responsibilities of liberty uh, as stewards of our community. And they're not talking about any of the branches of government. It's the authors of the charter referring to themselves as the stewards of the community. And as the mayor mentioned, you know, you have that right and that opportunity at the ballot box, but also uh, just in the day-to-day -day functioning of government and the ideas that you bring to us, the criticisms uh, that you rightfully make, um, it's, it's powerful uh, to, to see that embodied uh, in the charter, and that's a great way to end. And thank you for being a part of this uh, you know, civic. Missoula is not a great place just by chance. It's a great place because people work hard to make it a great place. And you folks taking time um, to participate in something like that, something like this, um, is really important. So thanks. Okay, so Missoula Municipal Court is the third branch of Missoula's government, and the separation of powers, of course, is very central to the government for the United States, and it's a very important thing to know that I don't work for the mayor, and I don't work for the council. I work for the people who voted me in, and to, for the system itself. And those things are important. Ideally, we work with each other, and I think we do work with each other really well. That's something that is great about Missoula. When I go out and talk to judges from around the state, I hear all sorts of horror stories about how they aren't able to work with the other branches, and so I'm really grateful for that. The other thing I want to say is that I'm just so proud of Missoula tonight when I sit here and I think, not only did we get this academy started, which is awesome, but we've got this great turnout of people who are interested in Missoula, and I think that is really excellent. So I'm very pleased about that. So this is the municipal court staff, and I tell people all the time they're absolutely the best employees or staff that anyone has, and I will challenge any of you who think you have better staff than I do. <laughs> but um, they are our staff. If you get a speeding ticket, they're the people that you're likely to be talking to first. They are the people in the court system who are the most likely to meet everybody here in the room because we handle 
traffic tickets, dog tickets, um, things like that. We also handle more serious offenses. And so, but the fact that we handle so many offenses means that it's likely, probably, that some of you in this room have been to municipal court. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but we are a very large court, very high volume court. We handle new statistics hot off the Montana Supreme Court's website. Uh, 14,599 cases a year. So that's what we did in 2018. We, um, up until 2018, we're the largest court in the state. Billings passed us, which, you know, I'm fine, you can have that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's a lot of people and it's a lot of cases and my staff handled them beautifully and with grace. They. Um, know that people in Missoula are the ones that they're going to meet and they love that and even though there's another group of people that they meet my staff gets yelled at, screamed at, sworn at, spit at <laughs> and they put those as that aside and they handle that with grace but then they handle the next person who is one of you um, hopefully with grace and dignity that I think they do and they are really great so I'm going to talk about. Is it again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do not touch the bottom buttons. <laughs> no bottom button. I want to kind of explain the courts because when I tell people what I do, this is what they want to know: is what does municipal court do? How is that different than district court or justice court? Municipal court and justice court were called the lower courts. Um, and justice court does cases that happen in the county, and municipal court does cases that happen in the city. Justice court also does, like landlord tenant, and they do more civil stuff. So if you've got a small claims court or a small claims case that you want to file, you go to justice court, and they help you do that. Municipal court, as I said, does all of the um, misdemeanors that occur in Missoula. Both of our courts are below the state district court. So the state district court is the court that does all the felonies, and they do the more serious lawsuits. Yeah, don't ask me what the cutoff is, because I don't remember. It's 1,300 or 1,400, somewhere in there. Over that, it goes to district. Um, if you are unhappy with your justice court case, after the case is tried, then you can appeal it to district court, and you'll get a whole new trial in district court, a trial from scratch. Municipal court is a court of record, so if you're unhappy with the case, the way the case turned out in municipal court, you also appeal to district court, but in district court they just look at the record, and they have to, you have to show that there was a legal error committed by the judge in order to prevail. If you're unhappy with your district court case, then that gets appealed to the Montana Supreme Court. And very theoretically, if you're unhappy with the Montana Supreme Court, you would appeal to the Supreme, US Supreme Court. And they take almost no cases at all. <laughs> so it probably wouldn't happen. But that is the system in the way that it works. Um, my court, it's myself, Kathleen Jenks, I have an assistant judge, Sam Warren, and I have a newly appointed assistant judge named Ethan Lerman, and they are the three of us. Justice Court is Judge Landy Holloway, I guess I should be pointing that way, Judge Landy <laughs> Holloway and Judge Alex Beal, who just left us to, when he was successful in his race for Justice Court. The district court judges, are Karen Townsend, Dusty Deshaw, <coughs> John Larson, I'm blanking out on Leslie, Leslie Allen. <laughs> so those are the judges in your neighborhood. So I wanted to give you this number that of, whatever it was again, 16, almost, well, 1,400. 14,599. 
So then I thought, well, what I'd really like to tell you is a week, basically, of what we do in municipal court. During the week, does this have a word? Oh, we're still missing that one slide, aren't we? I'm missing the one that had all of, all of the hearings delineated. I apologize for that, and I don't have those numbers with me. But during scheduled hearings, which are not the walk-ins that you would probably come in for with a speeding ticket, but most of the scheduled hearings are hearings that have the possibility of jail time, and most of them have attorneys. So during any given week, we're going to see 22 people who have been charged with partner family and assault. 10 with violation of orders of protection or stalking. Uh, 20 people who have been charged with a DUI. Seven people charged with assault and 50 people charged with theft. So those are the cases that tend to take up the most amount of time. They have the attorneys. They have extra hearings because they have the attorneys basically. And um, I do wish I had the other one. But anyway, in, in a week, basically, I think that what I did was I took next week and I just went through and looked at the hearings that we had scheduled. We have 31 trials scheduled for next week. So, some of those will go to trial, a lot of them won't. One of the biggest problems that we face in the court is people not appearing. That's actually a huge resource drain for us. A lot of those people just won't show up. And the hearings still end up being held to a degree, even if sometimes it's just to continue it or to put out a warrant. So we are a busy court. We also have four restraining orders set for next week. And um, I wish I could remember the numbers. I joke all the time when I'm on the bench trying to total up fines or something because I'm an English major. And you just shouldn't trust an English major with numbers. We, just, <laughs> we don't do it. So, so I think that's all I've got. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got, but I would love questions. Are we ready to do questions? Oh, okay. So we got Sarah to go next, and then we're going to take a quick break so we can stretch our legs, grab another snack, and then we'll come back and throw break them for <laughs> just pummel questions. Thanks, Colleen. You're welcome. <laughs> and, all right, so I'm Sarah Gray, and I direct the Master's of Public Administration program at the University of Montana. And um, I'm going to talk about the fourth branch of government, that the where all the action happens. So we always talk about the three branches of government. So even though the bureaucracy is under the executive, um, this is where all the policy making is carried out. And so 90% of policy in the United States is carried out through the bureaucracy. So everyone's like, what? What do you mean? Oh, I'm supposed to stand over here, and I'm sorry. It doesn't matter? OK. All right, so, um, so public administration is just the fancy academic term for the bureaucracy. So I think public administration is probably a little bit nicer on the ears instead of saying bureaucracy, and so I want to talk a little bit about this. So, um, so what about common perceptions? When you hear the word bureaucrat, what comes to mind? Red tape. Slow. Red tape, slow, what else? Open and zero for papers to Helpful. See, yay! That's what we like to hear. What else? So usually lazy, incompetent, no, but we're moving past that, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But really what we do, um, my background's in political science, but I also was a policy analyst for a long time for the state of Ohio's Office of Budget and Economic Development. And so really thinking about when Congress passes that legislation that's very vague, think about why they do that, right? It's really the easy to blame the, the nameless, faceless bureaucrat when the folks within the government agencies at the state, local, and federal level are really interpreting the law. And that interpretation becomes law, and so that's something that we forget. So what we study, what we're doing at the U, but what folks are doing, and I'll talk about the different roles, um, are really helping to provide solutions for public sector problems. So it's pretty fascinating and, and really good stuff. Um, so 
this you're probably used to, the hierarchy, so the structure of the organization. And so most agencies across the US, specifically with the federal level, are hierarchical. So top down, you have the executive, so someone that it might be a political appointee, or at the director level, they're providing directive to mid-level and frontline staff. But if you know, at the bottom of this, all the action happens at the bottom. And so we're seeing some really creative, interesting things coming out of city level government. Um, state of Washington's doing some really interesting stuff too. So what can we be more creative in doing in terms of two-way communication? So what we're doing inside an organization, what can we do that's best serving the public? And so that's what's really awesome about what we get to do. So um, just a couple of quick things in terms of what we do. So if you look at that structure, you have the folks on the front lines. So like she was saying, we're actually very helpful. So if you think about social workers or teachers, I always, I teach an undergraduate class on public administration, and I teach the ground level class, and so I always ask the undergrads, I'm like, why are you doing this class? They're like, oh, it's an elective. <laughs> and then by the end of the semester, they're like, oh, well, you're a bureaucrat. You work for a state agency, the University of Montana. I'm like, yes, that's correct. And they're like, well, you're not boring, and you're not lazy. <laughs> So just thinking about where those common perceptions come from and thinking about the politics. And so we always think about ways in which the work that we do is about our expertise. And so one of the awesome things about public administration is it cross discipline. So it's science, it's policy, it's looking at water pollution. And so you're really cutting across disciplines and saying, you know what, we're here to help you. Um, and so this just kind of gives you a demonstration about all the different levels across different agencies and what we do at the, the state, um, local, and federal level. This just gives you a snapshot in terms of our workforce for the state of Montana. And, and looking at over time from the 1960s to 2016, so Governing Magazine is a really great data point to look at in terms of, everyone's like, oh, there's too many bureaucrats. But, thinking about what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so 37% of this is, is we're focusing on education. And so that's what I get to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Sarah, could you go back yes. to that slide? Can yes. you read that just a yeah, little bit yeah. for everybody? So 37% of our state agencies is within the education realm. And then it's just broken down. So in terms of who's working in public welfare, the smaller percentage com is coming out of police and then corrections too. So the amount of individuals, so even though we might be spending a lot of money on per capita, so a lot of state prisons are moving towards privatization, and so spending less state dollars on that. So if you look in terms of what our taxpayer dollars are going towards, and who's actually implementing policy, the biggest percentage out of our state um, benefit is coming out of 37% for education, so the Montana University system, but also the K-12 system, so we're all under that bureaucratic umbrella. And so this gives you an idea of most of our jobs in the state are also, they're the bureaucracy, and so think about the economic driver for this state, too, that we often forget about. So this just gives you a broad brush in terms of the, the makeup, but I thought you'd be interested in what's going on in the state. And fortunately, there's a federal shutdown for those of us that work for the federal government right now. And if you have questions about that later, I'm happy to talk about it. But just thinking about separating that politics from administration, I mean, one of the foundational principles of studying and practicing public administration is that using your expertise, but you're often riddled your day-to-day -day job with the politics and how you reconcile that. Um, the last piece, which I think is most exciting about what we actually do, so one of the things we always talk about and we're scrutinized about is what is the one best way to provide services to the public? And so there's never always one best way, there's a collective of different ways. So thinking about how we're rowing the ship, so in terms of providing um, our expertise and providing services to provide an efficient and effective government. The second piece, too, is that we're the ones that are actually interpreting the law and providing guidance. My area of expertise is actually in regulation. Everyone's like, what? Um, so I look at compliance and regulations, so there's a completely different process for that, too. Um, but we often, we're always taught that Congress passes the law, and that's the final say. But federal agencies, state agencies, have a rulemaking process, and so they interpret those. That's a very um, participatory process, so you can submit comments, you can attend public hearings, and so this is really where the rubber hits the road um, for policy making in a really great space for citizen participation. 
and agencies will interpret your feedback. Um, they'll provide you know, comments back to you and say, hey, thank you so much for your feedback, we've listened to you, um, and we're gonna issue a new policy and that becomes law. The last and most important piece is just citizen empowerment. And so think about your next door neighbor might work for the DMV or a school teacher or a social worker, just thinking about the impact that they have. And we talk about public service motivation. And so you might not make the most money or, you know, the benefits might be really great, but that public service motivation actually giving back to your community. So I think that's what's so exciting that you guys are here today because you care about your community and learning more ways to become involved. But just thinking about, like, I always think about Jessica Miller that works at the, the city of Missoula mayor's office. She's the one that takes constituent complaints day in and day out. And so she's part of this bureaucratic apparatus about helping and empowering citizens to provide a voice where you might feel like you don't have access to elected officials. I think that's one thing that we're really fortunate in the city of Missoula because you do. But thinking about in larger states, you know, in Montana, you could call the governor's office and he'd call you back tomorrow. Um, I grew up in Ohio. You couldn't necessarily do that, even though I'm from a really rural community. But just thinking about that access that we have in Montana to not only elected officials, but also non-elected officials. And that's really a space that can empower citizens to become involved and to participate in that process like you guys are doing today. Um, I think the most important piece is the future, and so I have the honor and privilege to work with amazing students at the University of Montana. Um, our Master's of Public Administration program focuses on policy and public administration, and we have students, the Attorney General just graduated from a program this summer, so thinking about if you have folks at the top, the middle, or even pre-career students, just thinking about ways to, we have classes on human resource management or policy analysis or budgeting and finance. And so how can you become engaged but also enhance your education um, to provide more creative and effective solutions for public sector problems? So we think that's pretty exciting. So there isn't one best way, there's a variety of different ways. And um, this is our, our public administration and policy family at the U. And um, I brought stickers today to share with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants one, so there are I love the office of stickers. So but um, that's all that I have, but thanks for having us tonight too. So if anyone stickers they're here. So I have just a couple minutes to go over the Oh did the you get some back slide. Okay. <laughs> um, I have it in an email proving that I did, in fact, submit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see, the other one was how many hearings we do during the course of a week. We have for next week scheduled 31 trials, 138 pre-trial hearings, 15 post-trial hearings, so those are hearings on compliance issues. So. Um, revocation hearings, essentially, and 28 changes of plea. And then in addition to those, we've got four restraining orders. And then we have um, 16 hours available to the public to walk in and be seen on mostly traffic or for the public to come in and be seen on an initial appearance for the, um, or a more serious charge if there is one. Um, so we are busy. We do keep two courtrooms running full time. And we, in the last seven years since I've been there, we've eliminated a lot of the waiting. But there is still a lot of waiting when you want to come in. So I just wanted to get that last. Okay. I hunted those numbers down and I counted them. Well, thank you, Judge Shane. All right. We're going to five minutes. Use the restrooms, which are just down the hall, in case you've never been here before. And on the way, or on the way back, rather, there's some snacks. So we'll see you back here in about just a few minutes. Well, thank you all for sticking around. We are now going into our next uh, section here of the wonderful Q&A. Now, there was one person that came tonight that has not spoken a word other than introducing himself. Dale, was there anything you were going to contribute to this great conversation? Uh, no, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so just so you know, Dale's role um, behind the scenes is that he really tries to make sure that financially our government is sound. That's his primary job. So if you have questions about budget, 
he's going to be coming forward and he'll answer those. So with that, who has the very first question? Gold star to Larry. Okay. It's not really a question, but Brian, I'm glad you are somewhat concerned about the social media thing because I believe that a lot of retirees, older people, are disenfranchised in this community. We need to find a better way to communicate with them. And going to social media will make it worse for them. Yeah. And Brian, can you stand up yeah. just so that uh, <laughs> and see you? It's a great point. If you have ideas, um, I'm all ears. So not necessarily down. Yeah. 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 Brian, I have a question for you. You mentioned something about being against the statute to bring forth anything about an optional sales tax. Yeah. Could you explain that? One? Sure. So what I meant by that is there is existing Montana state law that um, for a local option tax, but it limit it's limited. The way it's written is communities, the only communities that can utilize that tool. Um, they have to be under 5,500 people, if I'm remembering that right. I think it's 55. Yeah. under 5,500 people in population. And, and so there's a handful of communities in the state who have done this. Whitefish is the one I mentioned. Um, there are some others. It's, and it's, you know, they've, some, some folks and in some places you see it called the resort tax. Um, but communities bigger than that, and actually Whitefish is bigger than that now, but they're sort of grandfathered in, as, as I understand it. But communities that have population higher than that, uh, like ourselves obviously, were, were prevented by statute from being able to do that. So one thing that has been discussed uh, that's a very straightforward sort of approach is, hey, this is a good tool. We have evidence of communities utilizing this tool uh, in the state. Um, Life has been doing it for, for years. Um, let's keep this tool. It's, it, the tax is limited to 3%. Just yell at me if I get any of this wrong. It's limited to 3%, and it's a very limited range of things that it could be on. So typically, the, the non-controversial parts of this are, it's something that could be uh, applied to hotel stays, you know, it's a room tax, it can be done on car rentals, I think liquor by the glass. Whitefish had an interesting thing. We had the city manager from Whitefish come down and, and give us a detailed talk about it, and he was mentioning ski clothing <laughs> is actually one of the things, because they wanted to capture some of the revenue from you know the resorts and the folks that, you know, bought big ticket items. So it, there's a bucket of things that are fairly limited. This is not a general sales tax on like where everything, where you're going to be going to the grocery store or whatever, and, and every item you purchase. Um, but, but it's a suite of things. And then the community is enabled to look at that basket, basically, and say, we're, we're proposing a local option tax on these things at this rate, and the money will be used this way. This amount for property tax could be 25%, could be 50%, you know, could be whatever. There could be. Um, uh, you know, Whitefish has used a lot of that money for road infrastructure. So, roads, um, there's been some, I think, some park work. You know, a lot of it is it's a great tool for some of those basic infrastructure pieces. Does that, does that help? I'm going to ask now a follow up. John, I think uh, in the past you've talked about how many billions of dollars come in from, from those tourist dollars and what that it would equate to. Do you remember what that figure was? Yeah. <clears throat> well, Ballpark numbers if we were to do a tax on the items Brian had mentioned. <clears throat> Excuse me, a couple of billion bucks scale. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, if it's broad, you know, liquor by the glass, all those foundations, it's something like $8 million annually to the city of the you know, you would use like that in more property tax reduction. And that's $8 million on our general fund of roughly $58 million. Yeah, our general fund, the property tax base in the general fund is, is like around 30 million. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really, it's a, it's a big and, and, and I think part of the, maybe this is what you're saying, why is it important that we have the, this discussion about a resort tax? I mean, there's, there's several reasons. One of the reasons is we're statutory limited, we're, we're limited to property taxes. <coughs> We're statutorily limited also in state law to this half the rate of inflation. It's it's a complicated mechanism, and it's a little more nuanced than that. Districts are not in that cap, as you hear. But a half the rate of inflation sort of increase, I mean, it, you run off a cliff eventually. Um, the, the vast majority of the city budget is 
police and fire, and that's primarily the salaries of those people. And they get into public works and parks, you know, main sort of constituent parts. And um, so it's not just Missoula that's facing this sort of issue. Every community um, in the state is facing this. We might be at different points sort of in the trajectory of, of facing this issue, but we're all uh, facing it. The mayor can talk to it well. So it's, it's a revenue tool, um, it, it, and it's under the umbrella of um, what I would call you know, um, tax reform. I mean, this, the, the state has a bigger issue than me focusing specifically on uh, local option tax. The, the state has a tax code structured for an economy that existed 40, you know, 50 years ago. And we have to wrestle with that as a state and move past it. And I, I think giving local communities, I, I'm an advocate for giving local communities that option. I love the fact that part of the requirement is the local community, whether it's the city or the county level, has to vote this in. So if we brought it to you and it was bad, well, it's democracy in action. It, it won't get voted in. Carol, did you have So a I just had one follow-up question. So um, if it's a state statute that the cities can't do that, can the citizens of the community vote it in, even though there's a state statute, or would we have to change the state statute? State statute, statute has okay. to be changed. And I think, you know, there, there have been multiple attempts to change it or replace it with a different statute. I think there are two active bills that I'm aware of right now. One of them, uh, if I'm getting this right, uh, it's a pretty dynamic environment, obviously, in Helena. One of them, essentially, and I, I'm a fan of this approach, it's, just, it's the simplest in my mind, it just eliminates that population cap. And then there's a second part of, of the tourism, of, of the local option tax, where you're supposed to justify a proportion of the economic activity within the jurisdiction as relating to tourism. I would just, I, I would simply just strike both of those. And a lot of people do that. The other one is a little different. The 3%, I think, number is different. There's different aspects to it. Um, it wouldn't be shocking at all, and maybe this is where we're headed uh, to see this come uh, via initiative uh, to the voters of the state. Blaine, I think you were next. I do, thank you. I'm curious if you got any insight from Whitefish about the administrative costs to businesses to implement, uh, and then also the dollars that actually ended up going directly to the town um, less, I guess, the cost of administering at the, you know, city level. Yeah, uh, we did see really detailed numbers of that. I may punt a bit to Dale. I don't remember, uh, you know, what they were. It is, uh, you know, there is, um, uh, uh, there's, there's work that has to be done there. Um, the, the, but it wasn't, my, my takeaway, and I, again, I'll defer to Dale, was, it's something new that you gotta get, you know, up and running and get everyone, um, gotta get it implemented. But then, you know, overwhelmingly, you, you were seeing dollars go to, uh, there was, it was low to maintain. So about six, in 2016, about six million bucks to the general fund in Whitefish. A portion of, a portion of the proceeds go to reimburse businesses for collections and administrative costs. Um, and then the city of Whitefish has a 25% property tax relief component to their, uh, their local option. Dean. What entities are opposed to the local option sales tax and what are their arguments? <laughs> I'll pop up. <laughs> so, so, so I'm here, I will try to make this as brief as possible. Statewide general sales tax has been debated by the Montana legislature relentlessly over the decades. Um, statewide sales tax has failed to pass muster with a referendum. The arguments are these. If you're a Democrat, which I happen to be, you believe that sales taxes are regressive and that lower income people pay a disproportionate share. They, they have a disproportionate burden. Um, I don't disagree with that. However, um, if you look at our property tax system today, lower income people are already burdened and um, this is new money and you can do some things through policy to compensate for um, that, that uh, problem with proportionality. Um, if you're a Republican, you want a statewide sales tax all day long, generally speaking and the notion of a local option tax erodes your support 
in the legislature for a statewide sales tax. So if Missoula's got it and Billings has got it, um, uh, those legislators don't care about a statewide sales tax because their constituents have been taken care of. So that's the, that's the tension at the state level that's gone on for decades. The two bills that are in front of um, the legislature today, if I were a betting man, I would bet that they're DOA, um, which is why I think the notion of taking this to the voters and making the case to voters rather than dealing with those tensions between the, that are today actually probably less uh, DNR and more uh, rural and urban. Yeah, on the rural or urban aspect of it, yeah. If you live outside of the city and you come in, um, you're, you know, you're going to be staying, uh, and you stay in a hotel or something, or you rent a car, or you travel uh, for, say, a softball tournament, you're going to see some costs. I think there's a great argument that those are completely legitimate costs to be paying to support the infrastructure you're using when you go to those places. But that's some of the tension. And we're talking about 3% tourist tax. It's not an 18, it's not a 20%. The VAT tax that our European brethren and sisters end up paying instead. So it's a very modest amount. And, it, and yet I think there's this, uh, this fear among folks that when we start talking about adding another tax, that we're adding another tax to already growing folks. What it, what it really is, is just trying to level the playing field People who come here to visit want to pay for the visit here. I mean, it's universal. And I'm sure you've talked to folks who come here all the time. And when you think about your travels out of state, do you even think twice about the tax that you're going to pay at the ho for the hotel that you stay at? You might look at it and like grumble about it, but it doesn't prevent you from going to that destination. It's new money. That's the issue. It's yeah. new money. It's new money, and it's not you and I paying. Uh, yes. I realize that um, this uh, academy is focused on the city, but I just had a question about the different roles the city has compared to the county and how you guys kind of work together. That might be a... So the city does all the stuff? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, so, so, so there is a boundary, right? And that boundary is the city limits. Yeah. And within the city limits, we have jurisdiction and provision of services, right? Um, county uh, is an extension of state government, so administers a number of state programs. You need a you need a license for your car, for example, clerk and recorder. Um, the justice court uh, course of record happen in counties, um, and uh, and we are lucky. We have we have good relationships with the three county commissioners. That is not universal in the state. Um, we meet regularly, we have uh, thoughtful conversations, and we try to work cooperatively wherever we can. Yeah, commissioners, whereas we have a very clear split, split executive branch and le legislative branch, they serve both roles as executive branch and legislative branch there. Um, but I would echo the mayor's comments. Dave Strohmeyer is uh, obviously one of the commissioners. You know, held uh, the council seat for multiple terms that I actually then ran for right after Dave left. So there's good folks there. Talker. As far as um, us and maybe each of us has like an issue that we care about or several issues that we care about, um, and I don't know, I guess maybe each of you might have your own perspective on the best channel to go through. But I mean, is, is what would you recommend as far as? Uh, neighborhood councils or contacting you directly or contacting the um, uh, school superintendent you know I mean like if you have an issue what do you think is the best way to try to affect change in that area uh, in Missoula I mean I guess it could matter if it was you know we could talk about specifics but just generally so so most people don't ask that question they just call my office <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually okay. I mean, that's part of our service is sort of directing people in, in the most effective way to get their questions resolved or their answered or resolved. Um, uh, we generally don't do schools, right? That's a separate jurisdiction, 
it's a separate form of government. Um, but you know, I always encourage talk to your talk to your elected officials, whether it's your ward rep. You're welcome to call my office. Turns out we return calls. Um, <laughs> Jessica Miller in my office, as Sarah had mentioned, um, she feels calls and and. What we try to do is make it as easy for you. You don't have to understand the system. You just have to understand that Jessica understands the system, <laughs> and, and we make those connections. Yeah. Um, broad, broad issues, policy issues, tend to be conversations that go beyond the quick fix of the pothole or the noisy neighbor or the barking dog or the couch in the boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, and you're always welcome to contact my office. Um, sometimes it, it's just not our deal, but we try to figure out a way to get your questions answered. And I'll plug for the war reps. Let me have Glenn chime in. The war reps then just call my office. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would add that um, I think most city councilors, yes, we set policy, we have high level debate. We also do a huge amount of time um, answering emails and telephone calls from our constituents. And sometimes it's just a question of who they should be forwarded onto within the city and sometimes I send them to Jessica, sometimes I, I know where else to send them. Um, a lot of times it's education. They have a question regarding an issue and I mean I, this is like my record, but I think I had a seven page email I sent to a constituent who doesn't like to talk by the phone and doesn't want to meet. He, so, which is fine and I like that, it helps me organize my thoughts. Um, it was a complicated issue also, but we do a lot of education and communication and I see city councilors as a big part of our job as being conduits of information. And frankly, the first priority is to clearly and correctly communicate that information. And then if there is a point or an argument we wanna make about it, sometimes we, we discuss that with the constituent, but, but that's, I mean, I know Brian and Heather, you guys, it's hours every week. They do a ton of so, constituent service. Yeah. Even if it's in a class, too, like, coming to the class center saying how it works. Mm -hmm. Just email me and say, all right, it's in your class <laughs> for free. So we're going to go Larry, Meg, and Casey. Property taxes. <laughs> uh, seniors living on fixed incomes. We have a, I don't know what you call it, ordinance or whatever, which I think is set at 45000 you can get some relief on your property taxes. <clears throat> Cost of living continues to go up. Do you see any possibility of amending that to raise that limit? So I'm pretty confident that's the, at the state level or the property tax relief case. Center. It is. Um, so, so property tax and the tax burden and the tax responsibility, enormously um, challenging issue for us. And it's all about service provision and our ability as our costs increase to maintain a level of service that citizens expect while, while trying to find that balance of not taxing anyone out of their homes. And we do have some statutory relief around that. Um, but that's why we're looking at these new revenue sources because you know we, we may have a statutory limit with regard to what we can tax, but, but there is a political limit as well. Um, there is a point at which folks just will not pay anymore. Um, and when we get to that point, we're going to have big trouble in the community. So we're always trying to find that balance where we're... I don't know if we'll have any trouble or not because the seniors get outvoted. <laughs> well, seniors are pretty good voters in my experience. Um, and, I, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm getting closer to being one. And more and more of our people live in apartments. They don't own property. That's true. That specific limit, just to be clear, that specific limit you're talking about where the property tax relief is, is set at state level. It would, it's a good conversation to have with your that, state. It's that, not a city. Is rule about limiting property taxes at 40 to somebody less than 45,000 is that a state? State. That's a state level, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a city, not a city ordinance. So. Christine, I see your hand, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, fine. So Megan, you're up next. Cool. Um, so I know it's kind of a hot button thing right now, but there's been a lot of conversation about affordable housing and addressing affordable housing in Missoula. Um, you know, and I think that one of the components of that, and obviously it's very multifaceted, is home starts and that we're behind um, in new builds because we're not creating enough houses 
um, to make up for the demand in new folks moving into the community and our community as it grows. Um, so I guess it's kind of a many fringe question, but um, one of the things that I have seen quite a bit of is there's a ton of frustration with the permitting process and the length of time that permits are taking to be processed. Um, and I think right now there's a backlog in permitting um, because you've just had a couple of people leave permits. We've, so, we've, we've had three retirements, um, which are a big deal mm -hmm. uh, because they, these were folks with tremendous experience. So a couple of things that we've done. One is uh, a number of years ago now, um, we blew up our zoning code because we were hearing over and over again that the zoning code was convoluted, out of date, uh, unpredictable. Um, we reorganized our, our planning and permitting office um, to facilitate development um, and get rid of some of the, again, the unpredictability there. Um, and we're continuing to refine those processes today. Um, and in fact, we're, we're, we're in the process of having the consultant who helped us reorganize to ensure the development could happen more effectively or having them come back and look at our system. Um, I am not aware of I am not aware of backlogs, but I am more than happy if, if, if someone wants to give me a yell, we're happy to look at that. One of the things I heard most recently from um, a developer who's doing work in uh, Billings and Bozeman is that our permitting process is head and shoulders above those two communities, which actually surprised me. Um, I don't know who mentioned Billings, but um, yeah, so, so based on the look of Billings, it looks like the development process is pretty easy. Um, but we're always trying to get better, and that is certainly an impediment that we've heard over and over. So I guess the question is, what's, what's the next step? Like, how do we make that better, and how do we streamline getting housing started in Missoula? Sorry, that's a huge question, but to, to try to meet that demand. All right, so, so we're coming now near the end of a two-year process. Just had a briefing on this today from Aaron Payhan, who is our housing director. Um, and we're revamping, well, we're proposing to revamp uh, regulations. Um, to create more opportunity for a variety of housing types. We're looking at our ability um, through municipal government uh, to help fund and provide incentives for more affordable housing um, and more housing in general. Um, we continue to look at uh, ways through our development services office to um, to use processes that other communities have done. Uh, at, at some point, I'm going to have a conversation with council about what are called form-based codes. It's the, it's the probably the the, the cleanest um, and probably most flexible way to get from a building idea to a built structure. Um, so all that stuff is in the works. There, the I think the suite of policies around affordable housing will be um, helpful. We're, we're, we're in what I call a slow emergency rather than a crisis, and um, we are um, fortunate or not fortunate, depending on the way you look at it. Uh, we're not alone in this. Um, successful cities around the nation, and particularly in the West, are suffering from a lack of housing in general and affordable housing in particular, but we're on it. The suite of policies the mayor just mentioned are, as you said, are all coming in front of council. We just had an update in December from um, from Aaron in the Office of uh, Housing and Community Development. Um, so I, I know all of council is expecting that we'll be wrestling with these and expecting a you know, big public conversation around them, but um, pretty imminently here for the next you know, couple months at least. And I think one of the other things, as a community, we have relied upon the market to take care of our housing. But we've gotten to a point where we are in a slow emergency. And now the, the onus has been shifted to government to pick up and solve it. Government purposefully moves slowly so that we have a process that is completely public, public so that we're not doing things behind closed doors and in secrecy. That is key. And, and so I know there's some frustration that it moves so slowly, but there is good reason. And I think Sarah would attest to it. You gotta have that, that process. 
Uh, Casey, you're up. Um, Judge James, you've had a lengthy career in criminal practice before you were on the bench. I'd like to hear how you think crime has changed in our community as you um, well, I think that's really, unfortunately, an easy answer <laughs> right now. Meth is huge. We have had such a influx in meth cases. Um, you know, our court doesn't handle actual meth possession, but we do do paraphernalia tickets, you know, which is the possession of needles or spoons or something. And, but even the cases that aren't charged as a drug case, they all got meth involved in them, right? And of course I'm exaggerating. They don't all have meth, but you know, it is huge right now. It's a huge problem. And so um, that's changed a lot. We see heroin now, which has changed a lot. I practiced law for like, going on 30 years. And I think as far as just the number of cases and just the overwhelming it's in every case, there's just a strain everywhere. It's you not know, this big. So. Uh, Christine, you're up. Um, we've been talking about um, the resort tax revenue, and, and as you obviously, some council members know I am in support of that. Um, but I'm wondering, and was sitting here wondering as you both were talking, Brian and uh, Marianne. Uh, you did reference other revenue sources. And in my mind, I was processing what other opportunities we have or, or elements that maybe those of us that live in the city and even work in the city still really haven't heard that you might be just looking at and thinking about and that other cities are doing that are creative or innovative. Well, we, we largely tap the source, right, um, in terms of new revenue. So whenever whenever possible, we do cost recovery, right? So um, building, you know, the building industry, we're trying to get folks who are building stuff to generally cover the cost of administering um, the rules and regulations around that. Um, our impact fees, which have been in place for uh, since uh, early, 2000s, those are designed um, to, uh, to help mitigate um, the impact of new development. Um, we don't recover those costs at, there, there is a justifiable and defensible rate for recovering those costs. We don't charge that rate because we still want development to happen, particularly in the arena of affordable housing. Um, we do some cost recovery around parks and recreation. We do, we attempt to do some cost recovery in courts. Um, uh, we do, uh, we, have, we have user fees in some cases, um, but, but there just aren't that many options, right? Um, local income tax would be interesting. <coughs> um, and a, and a good way to get drawn and quartered if you're the mayor, but, um, but there are statutory hurdles to that. Uh, so really, in terms of trying to find new revenues, it's, it's largely about looking elsewhere or having the state restructure its entire system to reflect, What's currently to, to better reflect um, income, wealth, extraction, right? The legislature today will be considering all manner of bills, one of which is um, in, in, order, in order for the, the state to get more money to do the services, to provide the services that they're in some cases constitutionally required to provide, they're gonna ask for a super majority to get that done. Well, hell, it's, it's tough enough to get a majority, right? Get a super majority and, and they're out of the business of reality, right? City of Missoula, we don't have the luxury of deficit spending. We don't do it. Right. I am required by Constitution and Charter to deliver a balanced budget, which means we, we do have debt, but that debt is covered on an annual basis and retired. We don't do deficit spending. And what we've seen at the national level is this myth. You can have it all. You can have low taxes or no taxes in some cases. 
but you can have the mightiest military on the planet, and you can have a wall, and you can have what, right? You can have all that stuff. Well, it's a myth, right? It's funny money. We don't get away with it here. <laughs> Thank you. What? Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so, Christine, and on that, what other sources are there to go to? What other sources of revenue? I had an economist tell me this fall that um, people, the best kind of taxes are taxes on other people. So Michigan taxes automobiles. Um, Nevada taxes gambling. Because it's they're selling automobiles to people out of state. Gambling, it's people out of state coming in and gambling. So we're doing a really good job of taxing ourselves, but we need to figure out how who is them and how do we tax them. And I think the most constructive idea so far has been a, the local option, tourist tax. Yeah, and but I'll, it's it's a it's a long ways down the road. I'll, I'll add uh, more optimism. Uh, it is the, clearly the, the the source, the idea for, for you know, the, but the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is you know other stuff that city runs a sewer system. You know, city Missoula sewer rates are among, if not the lowest, uh, in the state. One, two great examples of, or one great example of what's at work there, and this is you know not new revenue; it's cost containment or cost mitigation aspects. Is hopefully if you've driven out that way you see a gigantic poplar plantation. So one of the things that we're wrestling with um, is there's more and more stringent requirements, which is appropriate, about the phosphorus and nitrogen that gets put into the Clark Fork River. I'm glad to see that evolution, that regulatory uh, evolution, but it costs money and it takes things to, to meet those requirements. In our case, due to some really innovative thinking um, from, from folks in the community, one in particular who's no longer with us, we have a poplar plantation where effluent goes out from uh, treatment, um, gets absorbed, you get a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen taken up there, and it's reduced what we put into uh, the river. And, and from a dollars and cents standpoint, that has, you know, we have avoided capital investment or delayed capital investment that would come back in sewer rates to you by virtue of those sorts of things. We also recapture um, the, the first, one of the first things I was involved with before United Council was actually helping uh, write our um, climate action plan for the city. It gave me an, an exposure uh, to council. And you know we have a methane recovery out at the wastewater treatment plant. And now that methane recovery system is powering a huge portion of the electricity uh, demand um, at, the, at the site. So where we can be innovative of reducing our costs or delaying capital investments, that you know, you, you see that and what you pay or don't pay uh, as well. All right, so we have Brett, Elena, and Sarah. You're up. Megan and everyone else, I just wanted to mention that on the first, or the second Monday in February, I believe it's the 11th, City Club Missoula will have a forum on housing and affordability in, in the community. Uh, I believe Aaron from the Office of Housing will make an announcement more official announcement about what their first strategy plan is and some other organizations would be talking about it. And City Club's <coughs> kind of like this, except it's less exclusive and cost more. <laughs> <laughs> what was that again? Sorry. City Club Missoula on the 11th has a forum on February 11th. February, February 11th. And that's over at the Double Tree. Double Tree. Tree. Yeah. At 11.30 to 1 o'clock. All right, Elena. Um, yeah, you kind of set me up, Brian, on your, when you were talking about innovation. I have. I guess a two-part question. One, what do you think that we do as the city of Missoula that other cities around the country could learn from? And what things are going on in other cities that excite you the most to try here? This is kind of for anyone. So yeah, so, so I, we, do a, we do a number of things pretty well, one, one of which um, is public process. We haven't always been good at it, but we've gotten a lot better at, at it over the course of the years, which is why we have the foundational documents around planning and growth that we have today. Um, we have a transportation plan that had uh, extraordinary public input. We have a growth policy that had extraordinary public input. We have a zoning code that had extraordinary public input. We've got a downtown master plan update that's in process now that's getting a ton of public input. And it turns out one of our planning directors years ago once said uh, that if you're not doing things with people, they think that you're doing them 
to them. And so we work with our partners um, to try to get as many voices at the table so that we have support as we move forward. Um, when we do planning in a vacuum, we end up with a product that doesn't work particularly well. Um, and so the reason, the reason I think we're experience, experiencing some of the growth that we're experiencing today and some of the confidence that businesses have in investment, investing in Missoula is a product of those planning processes and the, 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 the guidelines we have on the ground today. I mentioned three just sort of down in the weeds things, but um, one, uh, the mayor mentioned um, transportation, and you'll hear people talk about mode shift, uh, mode split, and such things. Missoula is off the charts nationally relative to what we what we have here in terms of uh, biking and pedestrian use compared to other cities. And so we have very aggressive plans going forward. We've had aggressive plans. Our complete streets policy is nationally recognized. So Missoula is a leader in that area, and um, but it's a really tough thing uh, to stay on and keep pushing forward. Um, I'm, you know, I mentioned our, our climate action plan. I'm, I'm really interested in energy uh, and climate and um, how it affects local communities. I'm constantly looking to see what other communities, because in the absence of federal leadership on these issues, you're seeing cities, you know, rise to the challenge and, and do things that are innovative and approach things in, in different ways and et cetera. So I, I spent a pretty fair bit of time and I know that that is something that multiple council members have, have an interest in. And, and a last thing that may sound a little bit odd, but, you know, we uh, played a role in putting two questions on the ballot, both of which passed with, um, uh, you know, 62, 63 percent uh, open space. But, there was an open space bond and there was an open space mill levy. And I mention it because I think you're going to see that uh, followed by other communities as well. It, it has happened in other places. But when there were discussions about coming to the community for another open space bond, I know from my standpoint on council and a lot of my colleagues, it's, it's easy and kind of sexy and fun to purchase, make the acquisitions, to have the bond money to do the acquisitions. The harder part is in the annual maintenance and stewardship of those places. And what we, <coughs> what, what came out of a lot of difficult negotiations was a package, uh, essentially. There were two separate questions on the ballot, but one was a, a modest size open space bond and then the mill levy. And I would argue, and I did argue, uh, in support of, of putting those questions out to the public, uh, council has some role uh, in that. Obviously, the, the, the general obligation bond is a countywide measure, and the commissioner has put that on. But we passed a resolution in support of doing that. But I think that combination is something that you're going to see other communities look at as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud that we worked through those difficult discussions and put that question out to the voters because um, it, it, it sucks to have the money to do the acquisitions and feel pinched on doing the stewardship. And I think just to kind of echo along those lines, when you think of the things that you own, whether it's your car, it's your home, those are what we call assets. And in, in city government, it's the similar. This building in which we, we're sitting right now, but also our open spaces, are our assets. And that stewardship bond that, that Brian was talking to about, or that mill levy, is precisely that. We can own things and we can watch them degrade, or we can actually step up our game and be good stewards. So well, there's a second part of the question. I will yes. nod here. Thank you. There are about a thousand people in the city of Missoula tonight who don't have a stable home. Right. Mm -hmm. They would they would call themselves homeless, and that may mean they're sleeping on the street or in a car or in an RV, or they're crashing on somebody's couch. Um, their bellies aren't full. They may be sick. They might be mentally ill and they may be addicted, and we don't do enough to take care of those souls. And there are cities who are doing it better than we are. And so we're trying to steal ideas from them. And can I add that whenever we're working on legislation or tweaking something or trying to spearhead something, it's a common practice to look at what other cities in Montana or in the region have done, what are the best practices out there, are those best practices a good fit for what we have in Missoula. So it's 
I think there's always a wide net cast depending on what question's being asked, so it, it's, a, it's a part of the conversation. All right, Sarah. Um, and we may have touched on this for some of you, but just kind of to everyone on the panel and anybody, um, in the context of your position and the city, what keeps you up at night? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> yeah, personal. But. Uh, <laughs> what what disturbs my sleep are uh, are those intractable problems, right? How do I how do I how do we solve for homelessness? How do we solve for addiction? How do we solve for hunger? How do we solve for poverty? How do we solve for those fundamentally challenging human questions that um, that we're remiss if we don't at least try, right? Um, the, 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 the instinct is to throw your hands up and say we can't fix it, but in practice we do stuff, right? The 10-year plan to end homelessness, 10 years is aspirational, but when we aspire, often we achieve. We get somewhere, and somewhere is better than nowhere. Um, the little stuff that keeps me up at night are the 500 or more souls who, um, who we all rely on to do their jobs, some of whom are in harm's way um, every day. And you know, I, I, I dread the phone call, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, uh, I was thinking, <laughs> if you ask me, depends on what month you ask right. me that question. <laughs> yes. um, at, at a more general level, um, and uh, to kind of go back to uh, a point that I was trying to make or at least raise um, relative to the social media issue I brought up, um, in more than one or more than 100 conversations, I've mentioned to folks that, uh, and I didn't coin the phrase, uh, that we were kind of living through or in the middle of what uh, people call the sort of the post-truth uh, environment. Um, and I have to over with that every, every night. It's, you know, social media, there, there are manifestations of it, but um, truth and honesty and integrity are vital, a vitally important currency. And when they're not respected and, and when the behaviors associated with those are not modeled at every level of government uh, and throughout, you know, uh, throughout all the sectors, um, we as a society have a real serious problem. And, and I, I would argue that we're, we're, we're living a big experiment in that right now. And it's concerning. Also, a burrito after 9 o'clock will <laughs> Well, I, I would kind of piggyback on the mayor, maybe I just agree, but um, what keeps me up at night is wondering where the people that I saw during the day are sleeping when it's 10 degrees out. Mm -hmm. And truly, that wakes me up at night. And we see the same people over and over again. And, you know, they're homeless, they're addicted, they're mentally ill. And we get to know them quite well at court. And I know that they don't have anywhere to go. And as the, I watch the thermometer go down this time of year, you know, and yeah, that keeps me, definitely keeps me awake at night. Trying to find the boots to give people so they can pull themselves up by the bootstraps. I think we have one more. You're okay? All right. So we are at 9.02, and at this moment, I think the mayor is just going to fall asleep. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we most very much. Uh